Welcome, everybody, to a brand new episode of Strong Style. I am one of your hosts here, John Roca, from the lovely land of the angels, joined, as always, by my co-host, the big man down there in Orlando, at only Aaron Turner. His name, though, is Aaron Turner. How are you, Aaron? Goldberg is the champion. Brock Lesnar is the champion. We're partying like it's 1999, and I don't understand what is happening with my life. (laughs) <laughs> well, speaking of the 90s, that's definitely the decade that is the subject for our uh, conversation today. Uh, you know, last week you guys were so great to indulge us in a little old school wrestling with Nick Bockwinkle and Mr. Perfect Kurt Heading. This week, though, we are tackling Booker T winning his first ever WC- WCW singles title at a very controversial pay-per-view, Bash at the Beach 2000, where he beat Jeff Jarrett, who had earlier laid his ass on the mat uh, to give Hogan the title, then apparently the Hogan, the title was taken back and Jeff Jarrett by Vince Russo to give back to Jeff Jarrett behind the scenes, and then Jeff Jarrett went and lost it again this time to Booker T. And what you would say is a, actually a damn good match, not a great match in any way, shape, or form, but certainly a good title match. Uh, it's not gonna, it's not gonna, um, I don't know, it's not gonna like uh, make anyone's top ten classics list, but certainly it is a, it was a good match, and it was more for what it signified for a black wrestler like Booker T to achieve the ultimate title uh, for the, in, at least in the WCW uh, uh, division or a uh, uh, faction or whatever it is. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, the, Aaron, yeah, it's, def- it's definitely a showcase of Booker T's skills for sure, if nothing else. I'm not the biggest Jeff Jarrett fan in the world. As a matter of fact, I kind of think that he sucks. Actually, yes, not, a, not, a fan of, <laughs> not a fan of Jeff Jarrett at all, but I am a big fan of Booker T. So to go back and watch him and, you know, one of the craziest things that I came across watching this again, I didn't watch this one on the network because they've kind of edited around it. Mm-hmm. Um, some things because Jeff Jarrett's music is copywritten or something. He had yeah. the Kid Rock cowboy theme, so they had to edit that out. But I watched a version where that was still in. And like if you hear the original audio, the crowd is going absolutely nuts for Booker T. Like It's, yeah. it's crazy because he wrestles earlier in the night and he doesn't really, I mean, he gets a good reaction, he but he doesn't. He loses, yes. Yeah. But in this match, holy yeah. moly. Hey, don't lay don't, down don't, don't Canyon. Who's, who Come better on. than Canyon? Nobody. Uh, but like 3,800 uh, other wrestlers. Never don't mind. hate. Don't hate. But don't speak <laughs> ill of the dead. But you anyway. Just, you just spoke ill of Jeff Jarrett. Well, he's not dead. But he's not I'm dead. dead. I mean, His only, career, though. Well... Well, he's well, he's doing okay, but well, there, there's a lot. Sorry, Aaron. There's a lot of characters involved in this whole bash of the beach. Like I rewatched most of the pay per view just because I got sucked in, just and remembering back what the quality of the product was like from WCW at the end. Because this is like just a few years away from the end of it all, man. Yeah, about and a year so away. Right, a year away. So you're watching this, and this is 2000, Bash of the Beach 2000. So right, I, I, maybe I was a little bit incorrect. Not exactly, not exactly the 90s, but just coming out of the 90s into the first batch of the beach in the year 2000. But so many interesting characters. You have David Flair, who's still alive in this. Stacey Keebler as Miss Hancock. Daphne's in this. Uh, you've got uh, Big Papa Pump looking as ripped as you're ever going to see Papa Pump. The cycle hit the right time before he went out. Uh, I think, I think uh, what, is Buff Bagwell in this in, in some Buff way? Buff Bagwell, shape? yep. Yeah, the, is the franchise in this? Shane Douglas, is he franchise in this as well? Is here, yeah. Then, then you got Goldberg taking on. Speaking of Goldberg, uh, when it, you got Goldberg taking on Kevin Nash, Kevin Nash for Scott yeah. Hall's employment of, in the WCW, uh, and then you know Ernest the Cat Miller kind of steals the show the whole night. Uh, he's very funny. Uh, you got a Guerrero. I mean, sorry, Chavo Guerrero in this. There's so many interesting. Norman matches. Smiley. Norman Smiley. There's so many interesting <laughs> matches all the way throughout this thing. And then you have this controversy with Vince Russo and Hulk Hogan and Jeff Jarrett. I mean, that's really where we – I don't know where you want to start, but that seems to be the logical place to start. But I leave it up to you, man. Yeah, we got a lot of moving pieces here. we got a lot of characters in yeah. play. Vince, Vince Russo, like you said, Hulk Hogan, Eric Bischoff as well. Uh, oh, yeah. Booker T, Booker T kind of on the outside looking in on this one. Uh, we'll talk about his involvement a little bit later. But let's, uh, let's fast forward to the Friday before Bash at the Beach. And this is all according to Vince Russo. This is all, uh, I got this from Kayfabe Commentaries on YouTube. You can go look that up and and find his interview. But according to Vince Russo, there was a creative meeting the Friday before Bash at the Beach where they were going to decide, okay, we need to go in a different direction for world champion. Who are we going to go with? So they go around the room and unanimously it's voted Booker T is the guy to oh, be wow. WCW World Heavyweight Champion, which... To get a vote of confidence from creative, that's pretty daggone cool, especially a unanimous vote. So not Jeff Jarrett, not Hulk Hogan, 
not Scott Steiner, not Kevin Nash, not Goldberg, but Booker T. Mm. But Hulk Hogan had this little thing called creative control, brother, in his contract, which said, if I don't want to do it, if it doesn't work for me, brother, I'm not going to do it. So Hogan wants a match with Jeff Jarrett for the WCW title. Hogan wants to win. Vince Russo, head of creative, is like, nah, man, that ain't going to happen in his head. That's not going to happen. But I got to pitch to Hulk to make it look like he's going to come off strong. Right, so what right, he, right. So what he does, he goes to Hulk and he says, okay, here's what we'll do. We'll have you versus Jeff and a bunch of guys will come in and interfere and you'll just beat the crap out of all of them. And Hogan says, okay, that works for me, brother. I mean, I'll just, I'll just beat the crap out of a bunch of dudes, look really strong. But in the back of Russo's mind, he never wanted Hulk to have the belt. Never in any equation was Hulk supposed to keep the belt. So we fast forward a couple days to the day of the show and Hulk Hogan had sent a fax, allegedly, to WCW offices after they had closed on Friday, a real, real low-key dick move, that he was not going to do the match after all, as Russo had promised him. So we've got creative control rearing its ugly head in this world title match, where we are near the day of, we're here on you know Sunday morning, and here's Hulk Hogan, I'm not going to do the match, I'm sorry, that's just not how it's going to work. So I don't I don't know if you've ever had any kind of crazy conflict like this, but I know you're a big Hulk Hogan fan. Yeah. What do you what do you think of him flexing allegedly flexing that creative muscle? Well, and here's where we get into show. Yeah, and here's where we get into a little bit of the situation of the history of wrestling, right? Chris Jericho has been very clear on the record about Ric Flair doing the same kind of thing, trying to bury him, trying to exert his creative control when he had it in WCW, and he thought that he held them down, right? Same thing with Steve Austin. Steve Austin said he was held back in WCW, didn't get a chance to shine because the older guys wanted to stay on top. You look at Hogan, look what he did to TNA. He walked into TNA, completely changed TNA, and it was not for the better. You know, they had been on this rise with the six-sided ring, these different characters, all this kind of stuff. That he brings back all the old guys, including Bischoff. You know, Daisy lets this thing happen. And yeah, it got a temporary spike for maybe a couple of months and then a complete and utter uh, deep dive off the cliff. So this is a weird place for me to be because I don't really like Russo. I don't think Russo's telling the truth at all. I've never trusted a word out of that guy's mouth. I thought he was a massive dick this night. I, I watched this pay-per-view live with some friends of mine in 2000. This was right before I left to go to Florida, uh, to go to California. So I was watching with some friends still in Tallahassee. I was still living in Tallahassee at the time. And I remember watching with my friends and I was just shocked by what was happening because you really couldn't tell what was the truth and what wasn't the truth. Was Russo coming out and saying that shit for real? Did Hogan really exert this creative control he supposedly says? And Russo, when you go back and watch it now, he sounds like a butthurt fan. You know, sitting in the I used to be just like you sitting out there in the stands and crying. And well, like, I'll be goddamned yeah. if Hulk Hogan is going to get the title. Kiss my ass. And the thing is, Rooster comes out with that bout. I've not, you know, pussies come out and use, I'm sorry, I don't mean to use an, a, 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 a derogatory too. Wusses come out and use, you know, things like that to kind of make themselves feel like a man. Russo's a wuss and a half coming out with that bat really like immediately in my head. I was like, this is a wimp because I was, you know, I I'd finished serving in the military by that time. You know, guys who are real men and guys who are like fake men. You know, what's that? Jay-Z says, you know, uh, loud as a motorbike, but wouldn't, couldn't bust a grape in a fruit fight. Yeah, that's a uh, freaking Russo. So he comes out with that bat and immediately you're like, what is this? And then Hogan comes out, or Jarrett, the Jarrett music plays, and he just stands there, he kind of goes off to the side, then Hogan comes out, then Jarrett stands at the top of the thing, and then comes down, and then lays down right as soon as he walks in, and Hogan calls Russo out on it, and says, is this your thing, Russo? This is a bunch of bullshit. So, believing that he sent a fax on a Friday night, and on Saturday and Sunday, no one had a conversation with Hogan about this whole situation. No one tried to smooth it over, and they just willingly went with it and did everything that they did. I thought it showed way poor, uh, just, uh, just I don't know, just a poor look on a company to walk on. You would never see this in the WWE, right? I mean, the, the closest you came was Bret Hart punching McMahon. That's about yeah. the closest you'll ever come in a situation like that. Uh, but this was like, this was airing Dirty Laundry out there for everyone to see. Uh, and it was uncomfortable. And it was more uncomfortable to hear Mark Madden going, hey, man, hey, man, damn, damn right. Uh, and I don't know, was that Mauro Ranallo with them on the right-hand side next no, to Shivani? 
No, no, that's uh, Scott Hudson. Scott Hudson. Oh, Scott, but he's very similar in terms of voice to Ronaldo. Yeah. So um, I like Scott Hudson. I enjoyed when he would call the matches more than Mike Tanay, that's for sure. And so um, do you see this whole thing go down? And so I don't know how much of it was Hogan because H- there is a lot of stories of people who say Hogan was a jerk. Certainly Warrior has stories. Savage has stories. I'm sure a number of people have had stories of Hogan big timing him. But then again, he's the big dog. If the fans come and people pay the money, you know, w- w- is his argument necessarily invalid? Maybe he thought he was doing what was right for WCW, putting him as the champion, making some bucks, putting butts in seats, keeping him employed, keeping him making the money. Who knows? But certainly it wouldn't surprise me, uh, Aaron, if at the end of the day this was true, that he did some nefarious things like sending that tech uh, fax after a company hours and Russo being pissed off about it and all this going down uh, and then Hogan refusing the job to Jarrett. Um, it wouldn't surprise me because certainly at that time the Eagles were high. But I just don't believe a lot of what uh, Russo said. And I thought he was – I thought he came off like a child to be honest with you. And I've never – forgotten that memory and never forgotten the feeling I had and watching it again brought it all back to me and I wonder how much of Jarrett was involved in this because remember Jarrett goes off to run his own companies later on down the road so I I don't know what do you know more about this I know that uh, Vince according to Vince Russo Eric Bischoff grabs him day of says hey Hulk's not going to do the match we kind of talked about that Uh, then Russo has to pitch Hulk a more reality based storyline of okay well how about You'll, you know, you'll beat Jeff and then I'll cut a crazy like shoot promo on you and then we'll figure it out down the road. And Hogan says, cool with me, brother. We'll, we'll take care of that. But Eric Bischoff tells a different story. This, oh. is, I'm par- this I'm paraphrasing from 83 Weeks, the podcast he does with Conrad. So yeah, uh, go check out that episode. Eric Bischoff says that he and the the finish that was originally agreed upon is that Hulk would win the title outright. He mm-hmm. would leave. And then he would come. There would be a tournament to crown a new champion because Hulk was gone. He's, he pulled a CM Punk. I'm won yeah. the title. I'm out of here. So they would have a, t- a title tournament to crown a new champion. And then at Halloween Havoc, Hulk Hogan would come back to challenge whoever won the tournament, and there would be like an undisputed champion or something. So that oh, was wow. That was what Eric Bischoff said would happen. You know, there, but the regardless, the common denominator in the whole thing is Booker T, and Booker T yeah. had earned his chance. He was already a tag team champion with Stevie Ray as Harlem Heat, already captured the television and U.S. title. So he's kind of the outside looking in. No matter what happened during the course of the night, Vince Russo said that Booker T was going to leave with the WCW World Heavyweight Championship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like we said earlier, Booker T did have a match earlier in the night against Chris Canyon. He lost with a canyon cutter off the second rope. (laughs) <laughs> and so then Booker T comes back, you know, he's going up against Jarrett. Jarrett does the lay down, comes back. What Jarrett did before this ma- before the match was Russo, this is again, allegedly, Russo's mm-hmm. telling Jarrett all this stuff with Hogan, how, you know, he's not wanting to do business. And then Jeff Jarrett just says, you know, fuck it, I'll lay down in the ring. Like, I'll literally lay down in the ring. So there you go. You have that stupid thing that happened, the promo. Bischoff and Hogan leave. They're like, all right, cool. We did the thing. We're out of here. We're going yeah. home. Well, guess what happens when they land? <laughs> they f- they find out that Vince Russo has cut that promo that you were talking about where he says, right. I'm fed up with all the politics and all the bull crap that comes on through here. I got a wife. I got three kids at home, and I don't really want to deal with this crap anymore. Yeah. And then he goes on to say Hulk Hogan plays politics, that he he's – done nothing but tried to be nice to Hulk Hogan, but Hulk Hogan keeps throwing his weight around. And that ends up with Hulk Hogan never showing up again in WCW as he right. sues the company, never to be seen again. So you have probably the biggest star on the planet, and he's gone. Yeah. Forever. Yeah. And it's because of Vince Russo that he's gone. Yeah, and Russo cuts that promo as soon as he knows Hogan's out of the building. Exactly. Real big stones you got there, Russo, saying all the crap that you said during that promo, calling him a bald son of a bitch, saying all that kind of saying, is, is, I'll go to my grave. Hogan will never have the title or whatever the hell he said. And you just, it's just, it just reeks of a, a, a ballless dude, a gutless guy. And I've never, ever liked him, never, ever liked him. And I've always 
hated the arrogance and the cockiness and the bullshit about him all the time. And that promo he cut is a gutless promo said to someone who's not even in the building and him cloaking himself in the hard work of other people uh, in the back. Though, I came back for the book of T's and for the uh, whatever he says and all these different people he names out uh, who, you know, only Booker T, I think, was the only one to survive after that. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, he names all these people saying how much. But. To his credit, Shivani and the other guys, when they pan to these dudes and they're talking, the announcers, they all say with respect that Russo has been working hard behind the scene, scenes, working for months. So I don't know what the truth is. Were they lying to keep their jobs? Because Probably. Russo is essentially, yeah, right. And Lord knows I know about that. And then you go, another guy, you get the guy in the uh, in the back is is what was Bischoff's. Because I remember that this was a shared power structure. I remember at this time, because it had been Bischoff. Then we and we've spoken about this. They move Bischoff, kind of reduce his power. Then they bring Russo in to try to revitalize things. But Bischoff and Russo don't really see eye to eye most of the time. And so was this a move by Russo, knowing Bischoff was going to leave with Hogan and what have you? And did Russo Russo know that uh, when he cut this promo, Hogan was going to sue them, so he was never going to come back anyway? So his prediction that Hogan was never going to be in the WCW ever again over his dead body was actually what he was putting in motion by cutting this promo. Uh, I don't know, man, but I, I, you know, it can be dangerous because we want to talk about Booker T here, but this thing really overshadows the entire pay-per-view. Uh, and yes, they, you know, Russo brought out Booker T and Booker T does win the title, which we'll get to a, a little bit down the road, but I think it still overshadows overall this great accomplishment that should have been celebrated and should have been what you were talking about coming out of this pay-per-view. And unfortunately, it isn't. And I wonder, Aaron, yeah. do you know if they had plans for Booker T to win that title no matter what that night? Or did they adjust the plans after they pulled what they pulled on Hogan and set up that battle? Well, from what I actually uh, went back and listened to an old episode of Heated Conversations with Booker T mm. and Brad Gilmore, where Brad were, they were both talking about it. And yeah. Booker, Booker said the original plan, no matter what, was for him to leave as WCW champion. That was the plan. Oh, okay. That was the plan from jump. But what Booker okay. said was, you know, like, I like Hulk. Hulk's my friend. Hulk, like, helped me out through my career. Booker T and Hulk yeah. have great respect for each other. Yeah. So Booker, so Booker goes to Russo or whoever I'm paraphrasing again and says, listen, man, if if you got to if you got to give Hulk the bell and we can, you know, we got to go to me another night. That's fine. We don't have to do it tonight. I, you know, I'll bring my gear. I'll, I'll do it tomorrow. Like Booker T is just all business. Yeah. But the but the original plan from Jump was Booker T is leaving as WCW champion, no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what you just said uh, kind of goes to what Shivani said, how when they complimented Booker that he's a gentleman, he's a, he's respected in the locker room. People like that guy as a person. So Booker, you've never heard anything negative about Booker T from almost anybody in wrestling. You know, he's always incredibly gracious. When we did the Schmodown down there in Houston, Booker was so gracious to let us use his ring to, to like play a, play a storyline part in that match with us. And, you know, getting the chance to meet him and talk to him and tell him how much you I respected his work and he's been like a wrestling hero of mine was such a, a, a phenomenal moment. And so for him to have this situation and for him to be like, look, put the strap on somebody, put, put strap on Hogan if he needs it, it'll be my time some other time. It speaks to the character of this guy, you know, that he's not out here for the glory and for the spotlight and to get his ass kicked. He understands that he's he in his own, I feel like in his own uh, heart, that he feels very fortunate that he can make a living doing this and be a character that the fans love and enjoy and respect considering his story. Do you know much about his story, man? Can we get into that a little bit before we jump into the match, do you think? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I mean, I've, I've read... No, no, I'm, I've look, please. I know that, I mean, I know that he had a hard life. He did some prison time and he got yeah. through that. Um, I don't know too, too much about his back background. All I know, I know pretty much the wrestling side of it because that's where I came yeah. from, but... I, I can tell you that when I was when I was a youngster growing up and watching WCW, that I thought Harlem Heat was the coolest damn thing on planet Earth. Hell because, yeah! Because they had the coolest music, they had the coolest yeah. intro where they would raise the roof and the fire would pop out, and they were just they reminded me of sort of like the Heart Foundation. That's going to sound a little weird, but you had yeah. in the Heart Foundation you had Brett who was the technician, you had the Anvil who was the Anvil, he was the bull. Yep. And then in Harlem Heat, you had Stevie Ray, who was the big, the big guy, the big bruiser, and you had yeah. Booker, the guy that was going to fly around, and uh, you know get all your technical stuff. And when they broke off, 
the Hart Foundation and the Harlem Heat are very similar because when they broke off from each other, Anvil mm-hmm. kind of didn't really find his footing. And Stevie Ray did a little bit when he was at the right. NWO, but he kind of never really found his way. He's great on commentary. I would love to see yeah. Stevie Ray with an extended role in commentary, but mm-hmm. Booker T was the standout, the athletic standout, as was Brett in uh, the Hart Foundation. Yeah. And there's even a picture, there's even a picture, I have to throw it up on Twitter, of me as a kid, and there's, uh, like, it's my birthday presents, and I've got, like, <laughs> my wrestling figures, and I just opened a set of Harlem Heat wrestling figures, and you just see how pumped I am that I've got, <laughs> that I got Booker, Booker T and Stevie Ray in my fed against the Nasty Boys. I was pretty excited yeah. about it, but I'm, I'm a Booker T fan from way back, man. I always loved yeah, his man. athleticism. I loved his connection with the crowd. Like, he just always seemed like a guy that was working his ass off to be there, and how can you not respect that? Well, and the thing is incredible about Booker. If this is another person, this, the stuff that Booker has endured at times, if this was another person, they'd have like complained and bitched and made a large, and, and by the way, wouldn't necessarily been wrong to complain and bitch and, and, and moan about some of the storylines they've had to uh, pursue and do. But Booker always finds a way to make it work and make it interesting and make it fun. He's just a natural born entertainer. And in a subtle way, like King Booker has no business working and it totally worked, right? It, became, it was a whole Love second it. life. GI, GI bro has no business working and it totally worked. I don't, bringing, uh, <laughs> well, I, I don't know if that one worked. I don't know if that worked. Him bringing in Charmel totally worked. Like yeah. all these things that he was able to do throughout. And you're right. Tag team. I think I, I, I connect him more with Edge in that like. He broke out as well. Yeah, I guess the Hart Foundation totally works as well, but like with Edge as well, Edge and Christian, like Edge is the one that broke out and became the star out of those two. Uh, where Christian did have his moment, certainly on the lower titles, he was always in contention. But and Stevie, uh, I'm sorry, Stevie Ray didn't quite get there himself. So, but Booker was the one that busted out, and it was always because of his personality, his charm. People just naturally like him, and that's why he's successful doing what he's doing with that show with Brad Gilmore, being on ESPN. Booker just has this energy that people like, and you, and that works on all the different storylines he's been through. I mean, that fight with Stone Cold in the in the oh uh, uh, I mean in the, in the in the supermarket is just legendary, and it's legendary because Booker sells everything. His slow turns of shock and stuff like I mean, all of that is just brilliant selling, and that what he endured during that fight with Stone Cold in the grocery store. Some people might nix that. Some people might have an issue with that. But Booker was always, uh, in you know, in the best way possible, a company man because he's handed stuff and he always makes it work. You know. If I'm not mistaken, when they did like the thousand best moments or whatever, the hundred greatest moments in yeah, SmackDown yeah. history, it was number one. Really? Because, because of that no surprise. Price check on Jackass. I'll never forget that. I remember seeing it live. Man, talk about one of the the funnest things ever. I mean, there's a reason yeah. they keep Booker T on commentary. Oh, yeah. There's there's a reason that he's like on all these pre-shows. There's a reason that he's on WWE backstage. Yeah. He they love this guy, man. He's always game for it. He's a professional through and through. He looks like a million bucks. The guy can go day in and day out. He's probably in better shape now than he ever was. Oh, which yeah. Which is kind of hard to believe for him at his age. And that's part of the reason why we're doing this episode. His birthday was on the 1st of March. And what a what a way to celebrate Booker T, one of our favorites, than to talk about his first WCW title win. Yeah. So let's let's talk about it. Let's talk about the match. Okay. Let's talk about what okay. happened. Um, the first the first thing, of course, for me is a huge crowd pop for Booker T. And did yeah. you notice? Did you notice like they did the Irish whip about fifty times in this match? That was, <laughs> that was something I saw a lot of. I was like, man, they're they're doing that an awful lot. But yeah. A lot of good psychology because at one point uh, Jeff Jarrett gets Booker T. They fight all over the arena. First of all, yes, they do. Uh, uh, in inside the ocean and outside, yeah. In the Ocean Center in Daytona, which um, I've been there. It's a small venue, uh, very intimate venue. It's where they had uh, AEW Spider Fest. I was there, mm. so um, yeah, they they fought all over the Ocean Center. Probably about a five thousand seat venue, maybe maybe ten. But yeah. um, so they fight all over the arena. Jeff Jarrett gets back in, puts on a sleeper hold. My favorite spot in all of professional wrestling is the sleeper hold with the arm up, arm down. And then the last one they brought, Oh my God, I don't know why, but as a kid and and even now I get so compelled by that because you know, exactly because you know, you know, that one time it's going to drop, it's going to drop all the way and you're just going to be stunned. You're going to be like, what happened? But yeah, I love that kind of spot. And um, it was cool to see that they work body parts. 
Mm-hmm. Booker T uh, got his leg worked on, and then man, Book doing those drop kicks and the Harlem side kick and using his long legs to get to the ropes. I mean, yeah. they talk about it on the commentary about when Jeff Jarrett puts him in the figure four about how long and athletic Booker T is, but it's really an athletic display of what he could do. Uh, he did. I mean, Chris Canyon is a great wrestler, one of the greatest technical wrestlers you ever see, and is very low key in that. A lot of people don't talk about that, but Canyon is a master in the ring and does not get enough credit for that. And you didn't get to really see a, too much of what Booker could do in that match. It was more on Canyon's side. But right. this is a really a true athletic display of what Booker could be as world champion, and I think he nailed it. I think Jeff Jarrett was an okay player in this. <laughs> I think Booker T was your A plus player. Yeah, I think there was a lot going on with for Jeff Jarrett in his head. I mean, that's such a weird situation to be involved in. We look at the Hogan Russo stuff and then to jump back into another title match that was added on to the night. You know, all the guys are saying uh, behind, uh, behind the announce table, they're showing their day of their, you know, their show rundowns and saying, this is not on the schedule. This was not supposed to happen. This wasn't in the production meeting. So I think Jarrett is of two minds here, but also Jarrett's still losing the belt. And Jarrett's never been the best at giving up the belt. He's always been pretty selfish, in my opinion, pretty much a spotlight hog himself he has a very inflated sense of himself but hey that's what it takes to run a federation that's what it takes to believe you can start two separate wrestling companies and be successful at it even though you're not really in the top 100 in my opinion of the best wrestlers ever and you look at the situation but he he so you booker has to carry this thing booker has to be the highlight booker's going to win the title so booker shows out like crazy and the thing is i love this there's no fanfare when he comes down there's no big titan tron and he walks out just putting on his gloves dripping with sweat already in the black trunks no no extra anything just coming down to do a man's job the blue collar job get the job done you know and he comes down there and you're right the, a lot of irish whips but those legs of his you forget what it's like 20 years ago what those legs were like and how vicious he could be and how strong he was as a competitor and how he could do those like clotheslines and be like you know do his thing that he does the spinner rooney going out into the audience all the stuff that he did out in the audience as well like Ignore my all dog. of it no, so no worries <laughs> and then the switches with the referee like all the stuff that happens with the referees like there are so many changes and so many near pins that become believable it's really the last five to eight minutes of the match that really the excitement ramps up because you don't know who's going to win jeff jared coming out with that guitar and then getting hit with uh with booker t's finishing move you know you see all of this throughout but yes it's booker t who shows out so much better in this match than jeff jared jeff jared feels like he's hitting those spots like he's supposed to and he's not like going through the motions but there's not as much energy as booker is bringing to what he's doing you're absolutely right about that aaron you had jeff jared with the balsa wood guitar the old <laughs> slap nuts guitar explain to me the finish of this match to tell you like how crazy stupid wcw mm. was towards the end so there's a ref bump but the ref yes. like kind of stays awake so jeff jarrett's like this ref bump isn't good enough i'm gonna right. hit him with my finisher i'm gonna hit him with the stroke which right. is stupid why is he not dq'd right there i, right. I don't he's the understand. champion he's yeah. a champion why is he not dq'd why are we just letting this go all of a sudden right. and then booker t hits the bookend and another referee comes in and counts the three out of nowhere which, out of nowhere which, thank God for WCW and their horrible, shitty camera work, as they only yeah. catch the two and the three, not the one, the two, and the three. That tells you everything you need to know right there. But after the pinfall, man, it's like it, it's like nothing I ever seen. It reminded me of when John Cena first won the w, WWE Championship. Like, just how much the crowd was into it, and Booker T was into it, and just yeah. he held onto that belt. He helped the referee up and, like, hugged him, like... I was like, what is going on here? But it was a great showing. A, once again, a great, just a great showcase of what he could do. I, be, I remember as a fan, for me, 13, 14 years old, just jumping out of my seat when I see that my man Booker T is WCW World Heavyweight Champion because it was something that I didn't know if he would get to that level. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you always thought that a guy like Hogan or Savage or Sid or Goldberg or Nash or Hall, somebody would get to that level and Booker T would yeah. never be able to get past them because of all their creative control and all that kind of crap. But he did. He rose above. He became WCW champion four more times after that. Of course, he's a five-time, 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 five-time WCW World Heavyweight Champion. Gotta love it. And you even get to see the Spinner Rooney, which you gotta love it. You gotta love Booker doing the Spinner Rooney. It's just all the greatest hits. If you want to see a, a great Booker T match, this is one of them for him. Jeff Jarrett, not so much, but Booker T, absolutely. Yeah, he's so fun to watch. And 
because, like I said, it's workmanlike what he's doing. Not a lot of play. Usually he'll play to the crowds more, play the crowd more, but he is playing to the crowd just enough, just enough to keep them on board, and the crowd is loving it, man. And, and you know, on the heels of what happened, because people forget after that Russo, Hogan, Jarrett debacle, there's still a Goldberg, Kevin Nash match that is over in five minutes. Of course, Goldberg's never going to go a 20 minute match. Uh, and then you have, and then right on into this thing, you know. So the crowd is kind of like not knowing what's going on. So you got to keep them interested. You got to keep them going. So Booker does just enough to stay, keep them like attached to him at his hip while he does the things that he's doing inside the ring, outside the ring, you know, uh, uh, getting slammed. Or does he slam Jarrett into the table, the announce table? Uh, a Booker gets slammed into the announce table, takes yeah, that man. bump and rolls over. So there's so much that goes on in this match. As it builds, so you got to give credit to the uh, at least. I don't know. To, I don't know how much of they, this they worked out before they got in the ring. Maybe there was a lot of conversation as they were doing this match. You know, maybe there wasn't a lot of choreography discussions ahead of time. So this was more of them like figuring this out as they were going along in the match. So when the bumps happen, when the things happen inside and outside the ring, Booker T sells it like crazy and also delivers it like crazy. Um, and it's never too much like even when he wins he doesn't go crazy and run around the ring with the belt and go nuts and blow up like somebody else might or fall down to his knees and cry no to him it's like it's a matter of pride like he's earned this once and for all and he's walking around with it that's why he picks up the referee and he hugs him because he's like he's a company guy he understands we're all in this together like we're all, all everybody made this happen it wasn't just me i may be carrying the strap but everybody else makes this happen and i'm appreciative that i'm part of this team you know what I'm saying? And that comes through with Booker. And I, and I really appreciated that coming out of it. And I'm glad I rewatched it actually for this episode, Aaron, because my mind has always been about the Hogan Russo Jarrett thing that night. And it should be a little more now going forward about the fact that Booker T won his belt that night, his first ever WCW singles championship that night. And deservedly so. Like you said, this is a guy that had been on the outside looking in, and it was his time. And certainly everybody from the announcers to Russo uh, to what you said, the creative team behind the scenes, all believed Booker was the next one to carry the strap, is the next one to, to take them to the next level. You know, you know, one thing I didn't even mention that uh, yeah. probably probably goes with probably probably important part. Jeff Jarrett gives Booker T a pile driver on the announce table, and the table yeah. doesn't break. Yeah, like that. Oh man! And then the announcer, thank goodness for Tony Schiavone with the save, saying how how strong Booker T's neck was, <laughs> not, to, not to break for being piled driven on the table. My goodness, my <laughs> word! How about that? But something that's interesting, and I think yeah. tells you t tells you a lot about Booker T. Um, Booker did this show. I, I think you actually went to this show, if I'm not mistaken, um, where he was in Hollywood and he did it for the Houston Relief Fund when there was all yes, that flooding. Did. I was yeah. very and, happy. Um, there. I got I got the honor enough to edit the show together, so if it's available on iTunes if you'd like to purchase it. But one of the things that he was uh, he was talking to David Arquette, of course, who became WCW champion. Let's just not <laughs> even go there. But you know, David Arquette was in the back, and he had a lot of respect for Booker T. You know, he loved Booker T. Yeah. And he said he said, "Book, uh, you know, how many times have you been? How many times have you held held this belt, Booker T? Like a lot." And then Booker T's like, "Never held it, man." never held that world title so it's kind of you can kind of tell right there that that the guy there was a lot of pride in booker t getting his chance and getting yeah. to be wcw world heavyweight champion i know it meant a lot to him and i mean it meant a lot to me as a fan i'm sure it meant a lot to a lot of people watching that as kids say that that look like booker t and they say to yeah. themselves hey yeah. i can be i can be that guy so i mean yeah. it's it's not just him it's not just it's not just about booker t it's about everybody that in, he inspired along the way to be just like him. So it's yeah. it's a big moment that gets kind of understated, but like you said, by the Russo and Hogan and Bischoff crap. Yeah, it gets overshadowed by that stuff, and it's an unfortunate truth, you know. And it only took WWE 19 years later to finally do it after Booker had done it to give it to Kofi Kingston. And so many people were emotional about that. You know why? Because black wrestlers don't get a chance to lead federations. Don't get a chance to lead companies. And look what happened to Kofi. As soon as Lesnar finished him off, they never gave him a rematch. They never gave him a shot at the title again. It's been sitting there just waiting for him to come back to the title. And most anybody else who's defended the title for eight freaking months or six freaking months would get a rematch in some shape or form. But, you know, they uh, WWE adhered to this idea or fear that it was possible because you had a black champion. The ratings were going down. God forbid it's actually creative. 
Uh, and those kinds of things happened for Kofi, and it sucks. If you look at Booker, Booker was a good soldier, won that title f four more times after this match, and you know did his best. And he's done so much throughout. But you know, I, I think black wrestlers need to be getting more and more opportunities in these positions to win these belts and do whatever. Because yes, I know this is an old school, you know, Southern professional wrestling history. The foundation of it is built out with numerous white champions. But it's always good to celebrate when a black champion gets to be this. And I mean, a sole black champion. I don't mean The Rock. The Rock was half black, half Samoan, or uh, was half Polynesian, I think you say. But Booker, Pacific Islander, sure. Pacific Islander, I'm sorry. Booker, full black. Kobe Kingston, full black. That matters. That matters. That's why so many people reacted to Kofi winning it. And unfortunately, this was near the demise of WCW. And I don't know if there was as much of an outpouring of love from other black wrestlers for Booker T finally winning the title, being one of the first uh, black WCW singles champions. I'm not sure if there was another black WCW champion, yeah. but uh, yeah, there was. Okay. Yeah, there was. Ron him. Simmons, right? Ron Simmons. Ron yes, Simmons. Of yeah, right. Sorry, sorry. So being another in the lore, and that speaks volumes to WCW that they were doing that way before the WWE did fully. So I, I think there's a lot of uh, uh, credit to WCW, certainly credit to Booker T to get in that belt. And Ron Simmons only got the one chance. He never got another chance to be WCW yeah. champion. And, it, and his reign wasn't even wasn't even that long but right. something something else i want to talk about um yeah. an interesting point that you brought up in that interview on or when that he conversations episode i was watching book mm. he said you know wcw is based out of georgia it's in the south and he right. said i don't he said i don't know how they're gonna you know i don't know how they're gonna perceive me so that was always a thought in the back of his head like you know how are they going to receive a black world champion and he said you know apparently pretty well because they gave it yeah. to me four more times so I mean, that just goes to tell you how much respect that the fans have for Booker T, no matter, you know, black, white, whatever. They just love yeah. seeing Booker T do his thing. And, and just a, a quick anecdote about uh, Kofi Kingston as well. Mm. Uh, you know, SmackDown had its best ratings in a while when Kofi was champion. They got to go to Ghana, West Africa, where they had never been before. Right. The WWE had never toured there. When Kofi was champion, they toured there because it was his home. Right. And he comes into Brock Lesnar, he gets beaten like 40 seconds or whatever, and doesn't even get a chance. It's it's BS. It's a corporate machine. I get it. It doesn't mean I have to like it. But yeah. it's, it, it, they, took a, they took his title belt and handed him pancakes and said, go throw pancakes to people again. So, yeah. I don't know. I love Kofi. I'm glad he got that title reign. What an excellent, excellent match, and what an excellent mm -hmm. moment that was last year. Hopefully, I'll get to see something cool like that this year. But, um, yeah. yeah, Booker T just... I can't say enough of good things about him. He's actually let me do work for him kind of, you know, through the, you know, through intermediaries. I got to do mm -hmm. some work. for him, So that was a great thrill for me, you know, getting to help yeah. out one of your, your wrestling idols. So just a great guy. I can't say enough good things about him. Yeah, I'm kind of trying to win as many matches as I can in the Schmodown so I could possibly qualify to go down there for our live event in Houston. Just because I had such a great time down there. I would love to see Booker T again. You know, he just has that kind of energy I need to be around. That's why I always talk about talk to Gilmore about him because Booker's such a great dude. He's just such a great dude. And we'd be remiss not to mention a little bit about his personal life. If you don't mind, a little bit of behind the scenes with Please. this. Uh, Booker was born the youngest of eight children in uh, Plain Dealing, Louisiana. A lot of people think he was born in Houston. He was not. He was born in Louisiana. Uh, by the time Booker was 13, both of his parents had died. And he lived with his 16-year-old sister and moved in with his older brother, Stevie Ray. They are actually brothers. A lot of people don't know if that's true or not because in wrestling there's always a storyline they play out. But Stevie Ray and Booker are actually brothers. Uh, he played football and basketball. He did spend 19 months in jail after pleading guilty to armed robberies at Wendy's. Man, I don't know. Sometimes you need that food. You got to get that food. You got to get that Wendy's. Uh, when he stubbed the double stack, I respect I it. So. Uh, because of the gunman's from uh, gunman's from uniforms and familiarity with the fast food chain's operations, police suspected the robberies were inside jobs, and it did not take long before Huffman and three other men were found. So obviously Booker was working there. Uh, and then in, in his early career, he was working in a storage company in Houston, Texas, and was he was a single dad who was trying to do what he could do there. Uh, his brother was the one who suggested that he and him. He and uh, 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 Booker uh, look at a new wrestling school, and then that's how they all started, being run by the Polish Hammer himself, Ivan Putski. Ivan Putski, yes, Ivan sir. Putski, the Polish Hammer in conjunction with the Western Wrestling 
Alliance organization. Uh, his boss from the storage company actually sponsored the money to pay for the wrestling lessons awesome. for Booker T. Once again, he has that energy that people just like about this guy. They're willing to go that extra effort for him because they sense this is one of the good ones on this earth. You know what I'm saying? And people always willing to do that extra effort for people just like that. He trained under Scott Casey, uh, who helped to turn backgrounds of uh, Booker's background as a gangster and dancer into sports entertainment, teaching the newcomer income, uh, in-ring psychology and in-ring generalship. And that's eight weeks later he debuted as G.I. Bro. On West. So that's been going on for quite some time, his G.I. Bro character. Uh, and it was tied into the Raging Gulf War and Sar the Sergeant Slaughter angle uh, and all of that. From there, he just kept going, then got into the Harlem Heat with WCW uh, and did everything. That sens people forget Sensational Sherry was their Sister manager Sherry. for a while. Sister Sherry, sorry. She was great as that's their awesome. manager. Absolutely great. Never sexier than when she was managing them. Then became the world television champion for a couple of years. Reunited with Harlem Heat uh, by the end of 2000. Becomes the WCW champion five times, as we mentioned. Then moves into the WWE from 2001 to 2007, being part of the Alliance. Feuds with Evolution. Uh, then does a number of things. Gets a number of titles. I think he becomes the United States champion. He becomes yep. United States champion in 2005. Uh, then becomes the world heavyweight champion. Essentially reclaiming the WCW title again in 2006 and 2007 when he was King Booker, King which Booker. was the best. King Booker with the thumb. <laughs> so good. The pinky, rather. And then goes on to TNA for a little while. Then uh, gets to be a part of the main event mafia with uh, Kurt Angle and Scott Steiner. And I think Sting is a part of that as well. Uh, and then returns to WWE for the next from 2000 uh, for the for next few years is doing uh, little things like that, like you just mentioned, coming in as an announcer, coming in as kind of an analyst, doing all these kinds of things. And he runs his own organization down there in Houston, his own. It's a Ring of Honor Wrestling, I think is what it's called. Reality, no, no, I'm reality, sorry. Of reality of Wrestling. Sorry, Reality of Wrestling down there in Houston. So this is a man who's been around the business for almost three decades now and has given of himself so much. And so it's so much fun to talk about a guy like this and to revisit one of the great moments of his life as a, or great moments of his career and certainly of his life uh, as the first, as one of the first, one of the first few black champions to lead an organization. Yeah. Tra training the uh, future WWE stars, you know, the Usos, yeah. Jimmy and Jay. Right, so if Usos. you know them, Ember Moon yeah. as well. So Booker's doing a, a lot of good things down there. And who, what's the uh, and um, oh, the Punjabi war? What's his? Uh, Jinder Mahal. Yeah, he trained Jinder Mahal as well. He was a big fan for, of Jinder Mahal. He trained him, and he says Jinder is one of the best guys ever. And Jinder could have shades of Booker T if he had just a little bit more of uh, – got over with the fans a little more. I think Jinder could have been another Booker T coming down the pike because the physical similarities uh, are there between him and Booker. It's just a young Booker T. Don't hinder the modern day Maharaja, Jinder Mahal. Don't hinder the gender. I love Jinder, man. <laughs> but yeah, you mentioned it. Reality of wrestling. That's where he where he kind of hangs his hat now, training the future yeah. stars in the business. So, I mean, what better teacher to have than a guy that's a five time WCW champion? And allegedly, this is this is not confirmed because Sherry was such a, a private lady outside of the business mm -hmm. that during one of her um, marriages booker t yeah. gave her away that's i don't oh, know if that's wow. for certain because it hasn't been you know sherry's very quiet about it she's yeah, yeah, passed yeah. away she's left us but you know allegedly booker t gave her away so that just tells you how close their relationship was how cool yeah. is that to see something yeah. like that? that's awesome no surprise at all man no surprise at all once again one of the good guys why wouldn't he do that he tried to run for mayor he announced he might be running for mayor uh so that's interesting too in the 2000, he announced in 2016 he'd be running for mayor for the 2019 race, uh, but in the end, I don't think it came to fruition just yet. So yeah. he's, he's man, man's got a lot of interests. He's man's just going, going where he's on. going. He's got a lot going on. And shout out to him. Um, anything else you want to add to this one, brother? Two-time Hall of Famer. Don't forget it. Booker yeah. T by himself, probably the greatest. If you go back and watch it, for me, any for my money, and even and Paul Heyman said this as well, yeah. the best. Hall of Fame speech that you'll hear is from Booker T. Just thanks his wife, thanks his family. It's yeah. it's really excellent. If you have a, a second to go back and check it out, it's not one of those hour long hillbilly gym speeches. It's it's nice. It's it's a appropriate length. It'll make you feel good. Booker T, humble guy, 
And then he got to go in long, 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 long overdue. Harlem Heat finally goes yeah. in the Hall of Fame with his brother Stevie Ray, which I had been whining about for probably a decade, saying that Harlem Heat is the greatest tag team, is better than half of the tag teams that are in there already. Wow. And why is Harlem Heat not in the Hall of Fame? And then they finally got their spot uh, a couple years ago. Jeff Jarrett, you know, can't really can't really <laughs> discourage Jeff Jarrett. Also a Hall of Famer in 2017. Um, <laughs> I don't think he actually belongs in the hall of fame i don't think he is a hall of famer that's just my take i'm sure there's people out there that are wrong i think booker t even said himself that jeff jarrett's a hall of famer so i'll take his word for it over my guy what the hell do i know but i'm just saying (laughs) like in my eyes uh jeff jarrett is not a hall of famer but booker t two times and five time wcw champion most certainly is a hall of famer in my book I agree, man. Uh, and then some. A Hall of Famer and then some. Not only just in wrestling, but in life, it seems like. And so it's uh, uh, I'm just a, I'm just glad we had a chance to give him some honor here on our show. Uh, this uh, new show we've been doing, only a few weeks old, uh, giving him some love on his birthday. Because this is a class act all the way around. And never above or never, never conceded, never too high, never above anything, always willing, if it works for him, to be a part of it. And so I was, oh, I can't tell you how surprised I was that he was willing to be part of a Schmodown angle for us. Just meant the world to be able to work an angle with Booker T, for God's sakes, a legend like that. And he's... He's not short of opinions when you watch him on certain shows, which is what makes him even more interesting. Um, And, you know, him and Corey Graves have those legendary back and forths recently. (laughs) So good. I don't know how much of that is real, how much of it isn't, but Corey Graves showed up at his Houston relief thing. So I'm sure it's a a friendly uh, rivalry between them. But um, Booker is never short of opinion on things, and I always appreciate when he got when he's got his analysis on certain situations because he doesn't usually hold back. He's not mean about it, but he doesn't hold back. And you got to respect a guy who's had that many years in the business and his point of view on things. And I always appreciate it because some people want to toe that company line. Booker, because in essence he's essentially a free agent, never feels like he has to, and he drops his real opinions on things. And I appreciate that. Yeah, it seems like every everywhere that people are are happy to have Booker T wherever he shows up. If it's TNA, if yeah. it's WWE, they're just happy to have him there. But let's talk about next week's episode okay. because this weekend yeah. is Elimination Chamber. Of course, we got a lot going on. We got uh, the women's chamber between Sarah Logan, Ruby Riot, Liv Morgan, Shayna Baszler, and you got I'm not even sure who the hell else is in there, but the, you got a women's elimination chamber. You got a men's. I'll look six, it up. Yeah. You got a six team tag team elimination chamber for the tag team championships. There's a lot going on this weekend in yeah. regards of the elimination chamber, but I wanted to talk about the very first women's elimination chamber from a few years back, which featured Sasha Bailey, Mandy Rose, Sonya Deville. Oh, Mandy Rose. Anyway, and uh, of course, Alexa Bliss as well, and Mickey James. Oh, Bliss. So, oh, Bliss. Oh, <laughs> oh, Bliss. Oh, Mandy. And then uh, she's a great wrestler. But anyway, like, of course. So we'll talk about that match and what happened. And, and there's some crazy things that go on in that match. A lot of risks taken because it was the very first one. So you yeah. had to get, pull out all the stops. And of course, if there's a cage to be had, Sasha Banks is probably going to jump off it. It's just yeah. how it goes. She's going to put herself in whatever harm's way she has to. Her and Bailey took some insane bumps in this cage match, and so I can't wait till we break it all down for sure. Can, can I tell you? Can I tell you a quick secret about what I think about Bailey? Uh oh, yeah. I've I've re- I've seen Bailey wrestle um, many times. Probably the most yeah. I've seen any female wrestle wrestle her and Charlotte. Probably uh-huh. house shows, live events, WrestleMania, whatever. I think Bailey's like the best women's wrestler going. Wow. Just to watch her, how I mean, smooth, technically, she, technically sound, absolutely, okay, absolutely. Okay. I think okay. I think there's people that are better on the mic than her, obviously, but sure. I think as far as skills in ring goes, hard to beat, hard to beat. Yeah, well, you can tell her 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 love for the business is there. Definitely. Her study for the business, coming from the bottom to the top, you know that kind of thing. Sasha certainly, Sasha is also related to Snoop Dogg, so you've got a little more of a uh, you know connection to fame. Bailey never had that. You know, of course, Sasha respected Eddie and Bailey's got her respect for Macho Man. That's always been there. But I'm not surprised to hear you say that, brother. Honestly, her matches may not always be the most thrilling matches, but you can never complain that Bailey doesn't technically look good in the yeah. ring and she's sell never things. bad. Yeah, she's never bad. She's never like a two steps behind a move 
or standing there waiting for the hit. That's never her thing. She's always flowing in the organic movement of a, of a match, and that you respect that. Uh, and unfortunately, because her character isn't as strong as some others, the people doesn't, don't give her the love that she deserves. But hey, they used to say the same thing about Becky Lynch, and look, she turned it around like that. So, And I enjoy Heel Bailey. I love Heel Bailey. Yeah. Um, I've been enjoying her transition to that really well. You talk about the – yeah, you, I think you named everybody, actually, dude. Oscar is, I think, the one person you didn't name. Oh, Oscar. Okay. You didn't name. Yeah. Which she Talia. may get replaced. She may get replaced because oh, she really? uh, oh, okay. she's got an arm injury, so it might be Kyrie Sane taking her place. Either way, I'm fine <laughs> with it. Kyrie yeah, yeah. Sane will probably jump off of something. So. Shout out to Natty still doing it. My God, going into a, a elimination chamber with Liv and Shayna Asuka, possibly. It's Ruby Wright and Sarah Logan. SmackDown Tattoo is The Miz and John Morrison versus The New Day versus The Usos versus Heavy Machinery versus The Lucha House Party. How the fuck are they still in this? <laughs> versus Dolph Ziggler and Robert Roode. Then United States Championship Andrade versus Umberto Carillo. Then Braun Strowman versus Shinsuke Cesaro and Sami Zayn. Strowman being the champion. It's useless for him to have that belt. And then the Raw Tag Team Championship, the Street Profits, newly crowned Great. Uh, champion Great. Happy Street for Profits. Them. Yeah, versus Seth Rollins and Buddy Murphy. And then a no DQ match between AJ Styles and Aleister Black. So there's not going to be a male elimination chamber match. Is that right? Uh, there was. There just was, the tag team. There was supposed to be. There was supposed to be oh. an elimination chamber match between uh, Roman Reigns, Daniel Bryan, Dolph Ziggler, and all these people. But Roman Reigns just skipped the line, and now he's facing Goldberg WrestleMania. So uh, just, whoop, just forget that ever happened, guys. That's <laughs> so... Yeah, let's, let's uh, just forget that happened. We're going straight yeah. to WrestleMania, my second WrestleMania I'm attending, and Goldberg <laughs> is the champion again. Aaron I'm Turner. so excited. Aaron Turner. <laughs> I'm so excited. I <laughs> effing hate Goldberg, and he's going to be the world champion both times. Unbelievable. <laughs> Unfriggin' believable. Just, it's not about who's last. It's about who's next. <sighs> <laughs> Aaron broke he broke my heart <laughs> goldberg oh. hater aaron turner that's for sure broke my heart uh, i'm glad we both agree on this one dude but uh you know uh, i'm glad we both love booker t and i'm glad we both agree jeff jared isn't that da- isn't that good of a wrestler and we're not fans of him either but overall you know and you know my feelings about vince russo are mine they're not the shows they're my opinions about it should aaron has uh you know has that knowledge listening to his uh, russo's conversations i could things. take him or leave him yeah, he's a colorful guy, if nothing else. And wrestling is certainly full of guys like that. Cornette being another one that's kind of like Russo. Never short of opinions and never short of people <laughs> hating him or loving him. You never know. Uh, all right, well, that's this episode of Strong Style. Can't thank you all enough for uh, watching or listening to this episode. Aaron and I love doing the show. We're big fans of professional wrestling. You know, our whole thing is to go back in time and revisit these seminal moments in wrestling, seminal matches in wrestling, and talk about them, break them down, give our thoughts and opinions, give a little bit of thoughts about the background, talk about the legacy and then go forward into our next episode aaron where can they find you my man thanks so much for coming on the show always good to be here with you john at only aaron turner on twitter and do me one favor if you do nothing else guys vote just vote <laughs> that's, that's all i can say i'm not gonna i'm not gonna pressure you i'm not gonna pressure you into what side that's that's all you just right just be responsible with it don't be like last time and write in harambe like just actually vote <laughs> That's all I ask. Just vote, please. That's it. What's going on? Down there? What's going on down in Orlando? People in Harambe. Dude, Harambe <laughs> and and I swear, broken Matt Hardy got enough <laughs> enough votes that he was contacted by like the Secret Service to tell him that he hadn't won. But anyway, just use oh. your vote responsibly. It does matter. It does count. Please vote. Oh, uh, real quick. Uh, two things, real quick. Uh, are, uh, Matt Hardy going to AEW? You excited about this? Um, or do you think I'll, it's? Do you think he's a bit, a little bit out of it? Oh, man, I can't I can't make a short answer of this because I really like what AEW did at the pay per view, and I really yeah. like Dynamite. So they're kind of turning a corner with me. Like I was so down on it, but yeah, God, dude, anything Cody does, we talked about this before the show, but anything Cody does, I'm on board for, man. So okay, I'll ride with Cody till the end. If he's gonna bring in Matt Hardy, hell yeah. Would you would you say that if you were on the fence about it or weren't enjoying AEW before, jump on here on this last pay per view and Dynamite? It'll turn you around on it. Definitely, especially okay. the promo between Cody and Jake the Snake Roberts. Unbelievable stuff. Okay, all right. I'll jump on board then. I'll watch that myself. Uh, and the second thing, did you get a chance to watch those guys do that wrestling in Walmart? Is that insane or what? God, which video? There's so many of them. I mean, oh, it, they, I just, do this happen all the there's time? There's quite a few. Oh, God. Oh. It's, like a, it's like a thing now. But Really? Yeah. Oh, gosh, yeah, dude. It's a, Walmart wrestling not, is a thing? 
and it's probably a hashtag at this point, but yeah, there's there was a dude, there was one guy, okay, check this out. So, do you know what a Spanish fly is? Of course I don't like Spanish flies. Well, I mean, the move, a Spanish fly, not like... Oh! Uh, <laughs> so, but, uh, yeah, go ahead. It's, it's when you're on the top rope with somebody else and you're facing different directions. And yes. then you do a backflip and with the person and slam them. Well, somebody did a fr- in Walmart on the paint counter did a Spanish fly from the counter onto like bean bags and it was perfect. Wow. And I and I didn't expect it. Like I'm sitting there, I'm like, this is stupid, this is dumb. And then they did that and it popped me. I was like, oh my god, that was amazing. Like they <laughs> like somebody should sign these guys. But yeah, I, don't try that at home. That's not a good idea. The, How did they get away with this? How did they not arrest it? Dude, you been to Walmart? There's like, <laughs> there's like two registers open. Like, who's going to stop them? Bro, not willingly. Not willingly. <laughs> not, yeah, that's that's probably what happens. A Walmart employee sees them doing that, and they're like, Oof. nah, that ain't my department. <laughs> <laughs> they ain't paid me enough to deal with that. Yeah, that ain't me. Man. I'm happy. <laughs> that's true. It's, I don't know what it is about Walmarts, man. I went to the Walmart one in Burbank once, and I was like, how did they transport these people here? Because I've never seen these people in Burbank. Who are these people? Uh, anyway, just because you go to the Target, those people don't go to the Target. For some reason, those people go only to the Walmart, like moths to a flame, I guess. Uh, all right. Anyway, there you go. That's it before we get into too much trouble. Thank you all again for watching this episode of Strong Style. You can follow me at the Roca Says on Twitter and on Instagram. As Aaron said, follow him at only Aaron Turner. Please hit that subscribe button below. Give us some more subscriptions. I'm trying to get to that 20,000 subscriber mark as soon as I can. Doing all this content on the Outlaw Nation channel to make that happen. So would appreciate any support there. And here's the biggest thing. Remember to like this video and then share this video on your social media. And I always say this, if you share the video, it's giving a stamp of approval to us and to the video and to the show for people to come aboard and enjoy the show with you. You guys can talk about it afterwards. So please share it on your social media and do everything like that and subscribe. All right, we'll talk to you next week with that Elimination Chamber, first Women's Elimination Chamber here on the next episode, A Strong Style.